Bienvenidos, welcome everybody, and we are delighted to have uh, this uh, kind of conversation in our special show, the, the Stream, where we have streaming conversations with people who are behind some of the most outstanding works that we have been uh, able to read in comic books. And in this occasion, uh, we are really glad to have uh, as our guest, Paul Const Constant. How are you doing, Paul? Just fine. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure, and uh, we will be discussing about the, a, a specific uh, book and uh, the impact that it has been having in, in the general culture. But before we go, we go there, let me allow me to be, introduce the rest of our merry band. And uh, we have actually, uh, in this screen, we have Nightboy. Hi, good night. Well, thanks for joining us again. Yes. And of course, we have the, the element of fashion, the element that it's always popular. We have El Buki. Hi. <laughs> that that's the introduction that we usually give for him in, in Spanish on a regular show in the strip panel. Remember that this uh, will be also available not only on video but in the audio version. So if you are only following us in by by, by those means, you don't worry, you will get the show. And uh, tonight, as uh, I mentioned, we are delighted to be talking with uh, with Paul Constant, who is the author of uh, well, co-author of one of the most outstanding series that we have read on Ahoy. Ahoy is uh, one of the one of the comic studios that we are really having a, a lot of uh, fun with with them because, as Tom Peller, uh, Tom Peller once mentioned, uh, they are actually trying to bring fun back to, to comic books. Um, they are not just writing fun stuff. They are doing a lot of uh, a particular smart writing. And in this case, Paul, with your book, Planet of the Nerds, uh, I believe that it's something uh, that, that like a must read for, for current generations. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Planet of the Nerds and, and how the, the, the idea for this comic book uh, came to you? Yeah, I, um, I do a lot of different kinds of writing. I do journalism. I do, uh, uh, I write, I have a site called Seattle Review of Books where I run book reviews um, and uh, I write about political stuff. And so um, it's, and of course, I've been a nerd my whole life. You know, I grew up reading comics. I learned how to read on comic books. And so um, I, uh, it just occurred to me um, now I'm, I'm uh, 43 years old. And it occurred to me that, that, that being a nerd now is completely different than it was when I was growing up. Like I, almost got beaten up several times in high school because I read comic books, you know, and um, now knowing about comic books gives you almost like a cultural currency. It's almost cool because they're in theaters and they're, you know, everybody is, is everybody wants to be a computer programmer and, and all this. And so, um, and so it seemed to me that the best way to write about the difference between being a nerd then and being a nerd now is to um is was was through fiction uh, uh, we're hearing uh, some noise allow me to mention just uh, ricardo the, the other member of, of our merry band just uh, joined us but we're hearing a lot of noises i believe that he's in um in uh in asylum no 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 he's uh i don't know what he's doing he's right now on, uh, on camera but he will connect sorry about that paul uh please continue. no it's okay it's okay he's uh yeah he's just doing nothing. no problem um so yeah i i it seemed like uh this idea was the best way to approach it was through fiction and so when um uh tom payer reached out to me and asked if i had any ideas for a comic i uh it was it was something that had been on my mind it was something that i wanted to talk about and i thought the best way to do that um you know the movie back to the future um which i i love uh sort of did the same thing it, it approached the 1950s from the 1980s and so i wanted to look at the 1980s from the 20 teens or whatever you call it and so uh uh that was the pitch and he was uh very interested right away and and we started working on it so uh that was a long answer i wish i could say it was something like a bat flying in my window or something like that but it was it was a little more involved than that <laughs> well uh you you could say that perhaps a nerd was flying uh, through your window he was yes. actually being thrown by uh, by beef or or one of the peculiar characters from 80s comedies or something like yes, that right i was i was bitten by a radioactive nerd <laughs> Uh, as pretty much I believe most of us have been, and uh, <laughs> uh, let's not get into details. But well, we have some some other question. Gilberto, I believe that you have something prepared, also, right? Uh, 
I have like a two-hour conversation prepared. No, uh, well, actually, yes, but no. Uh, as we were talking uh, right before we started trans uh, transmission, uh, it seems like uh, you were, uh, as you just said, you were just uh, trying to go through uh, your, your youth uh, while you were a uh, youngster. And uh, it, are, there, the, are, there, are the characters kind of reflecting someone you knew on high school, well, while you were on high school? And uh, please tell me that you are not the cryo gene. <laughs> <nerd tech. laughs> yeah, this is not a story, history of revenge or something like that. No, but are, are the characters something that you remember that uh, I'm not going to say that I used to be like that, but uh, yeah, that, no, me will, will say that, that I am. It's uh, <laughs> people that uh, we were on football team or things like that and kept our, kept our comic books on our locker rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, did to you or can you relate to these experiences or something like that? I can a little bit. I mean, there's no one character who's me and there's no one character who are my friends uh, growing up or anything like that. But it is very, um, uh, you know, the, 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 some of the experiences are, are, are my own of being bullied. I was, I was bullied a little bit in high school. It wasn't very bad, but there were some, some you know, uh, uh, alpha male jock types who, who enjoyed picking on poor little nerdy me. Um, but I think that it's, 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 it's always more complex in real life, right? I think that, um, you know, as I was writing this book, I was going back and thinking about myself in high school. And, and I think that I was probably bullying some other sort of nerdier people in high school. And in fact, I reached out to one um, on Facebook who, and I was like, I'm, I think I gave you a hard time in high school. This is while I was writing the book. I was like, I think I gave you a hard time in high school and I'm really sorry about that. And, and I just wanted you to know that I've been thinking about it and everything. And he honestly couldn't remember what I was talking about. So, um, so that was nice. But, um, but I think that, you know, it's, 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 it's the book really simplifies it and plays with sort of all those old movies, The Breakfast Club and uh, and Back to the Future and, and, and makes it sort of a, a, a binary, a good and evil thing um, to make it sort of easier to to digest the ideas a little bit. So it's a little bit of reality, but it's a little bit of of, uh, of pop culture and the portrayal of nerds and jocks that I think we've all seen so many times. Because, um, you know, if you're watching a movie and they want to make you feel bad for the main character, they make the main character a nerd, right? Like they make, they have people picking on him. And, and um, so I wanted to sort of play with that idea, I think. Um, and and so, so we start out with a very simple, the jocks hate the nerds and the nerds are the victims. And then we sort of play with that as we go along. Mm -hmm. So you would say that it's kind of like... Uh, uh, Playing with the stereotypes of, of the era? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that the stereotypes are so ingrained that it's, uh, uh, you know, if I were to drop you in the middle of a, an, an, uh, an old West town like, like you see in the, in the cowboy movies and somebody comes up in a black hat, you're going to be like, oh my God, it's the bad guy. Um, I, think, I think that we have that ingrained in our heads so much about 80s culture that, that that was something that I wanted to that I wanted to play with and maybe address a little bit of the 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 reality behind the stereotypes. All right, and for example, uh, I am uh, aware you sharing with some of the covers of the of the comic book. In mm -hmm. case that you haven't uh, got the chance to pick it up, uh, the trade paperback actually just was released, I believe, the, la, la, last week. Um, so yep. you you can get familiar about, about that and part of the work that uh, it's uh, really interesting in this uh, you, you have already mentioned playing with the stereotypes and now uh, we also in case that you guys are interested we also have an interview with alan robinson where he tells a little bit about the details of, of the character building so uh, i want to to ask you about this uh, paul uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the, the the world building and the character building for this particular story you already mentioned that you are playing with some of the stereotypes. However, you have a, a really interesting uh, game with the sensitivities. And we can see, that, for example, when uh, the, the, the main trio wakes up in the present and how for some can be like uh, something dis uh, distasteful, something dis uh, as a disaster. But for some other, it's like, oh, cool, you have a black Spider-Man right now. This is really cool. Yes. So yes. can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I think that um, I I didn't want to just make it, uh, uh, you know, a dystopia like they wake up in the present and they're horrified by everything because I don't think that, you know, I don't think that that everything that's happened is great. And I don't think that everything that's happened is is bad. And I think that um, having the different jocks uh, sort of realize that there are different uh, that that, you know, some of the things are cool and some of the things are um that have happened are are for the better. Um, and so um, uh, I really enjoyed writing the backup stories, uh, mm. which are drawn by uh, a fellow named Randy Elliott, who did an amazing job. Yeah. Um, uh, that uh, part of the, the whole Ahoy dynamic is there's a, a lead story in each issue and then there are backup stories. And so uh, they were nice enough to let me do backup stories that, ha that focused on each character's life um, uh, apart from the story, so the jocks before they they um, before they they got frozen and and came to in the modern day, and those really helped me. Those little stories helped me figure out who they were and what they what their interests were and all that. And so, it sort of evolved over the the course of the story. Like um, one of the characters, Drew. Um, I don't know how this happened. It was one of those things that just came out in the writing. But I I, I had him he just suddenly started expressing a deep interest in ex economics. And I was like, I don't know where that came from, oh. um, but uh, I really liked it. And so I started playing with it. And in fact, um, uh, that helped me make the character sort of a closeted nerd, you know? And I, th I think that gave him sort of a bridge between the two worlds. Um, but that wasn't a part of the original pitch. Um, and it was, it was just something that happened organically as I was working with Randy on the short stories. And um, I think that Alan, gave the characters a lot of depth um and i think that just looking at the pages that he was bringing back to me the way that drew would react to chad who was the big angry lead jock um uh gave me a sense that he was he was not entirely on board with the bullying you know and uh that was something that i wouldn't have come to on my own but it was it was through the collaboration with the artists that really made it work and that's what i love about comics it's 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 not all me it's it's uh it's a it's a true collaboration and alan was just amazing part of the reason that we picked him was because he's so good at body language and he's so good at action and he's so good at all that stuff um that he really gave the characters a depth that that helped me as a writer did i answer your question i feel like i just don't, don't rambled worry. off into the sunset. Not, you, and you actually gave us more information uh, <laughs> that we can uh, be exploring for the rest and uh, we're going with uh, daniel villamil with the wookie uh, do you have also a question right yes uh, well part of my question was about this character is like a nerd closet but uh, you answered that so <laughs> when uh, when do you believe stars the nerds to be cool because the the tree wake up and they're why when how did this happen mm -hmm. um uh uh well it was really important for them to realize that things were different immediately um and so i think having them wander into a comic book convention first thing was was really was was the the uh the important thing i think that that tom payer um uh, my editor, he he was very sort of adamant that you have to like set up the dynamic in the first issue and you have to like you have to you can't um, you can't mess around and you can't take forever to get to the point. Um, and so I wanted to have them realize where they were immediately. Um, and so uh, so that was. Yeah, that was when I that was when I had the characters realize that the that the nerds were cool. Did that answer your question or or I'm sorry? <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. And uh, uh, as uh, we mentioned, uh, we're seeing of the pages of issue issue number two where they have this confrontation in uh, Pasadena Comic Con in there, uh, Pasadena yeah. Conda. Um, and it's interesting because, for example, uh, part of the thing that we are uh, looking at right now, it's uh, this sort of uh, generation gap, uh, generation conflict. And uh, for example, millennials ba versus baby boomers. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. us who are in the generation X, we are just having fun seeing each other fighting. Uh, but yeah. in, in this case, you have also the confrontation like, uh, okay, 
old times way were always better. And it's like, well, perhaps you remember uh, old times like being better because you didn't have a lot of responsibilities. But in this case, you have something that you are actually bringing from the past to the present and saying, well, uh, how, how can people communicate right now if you don't have the yellow pages and you don't have right. public phones? So yeah. there you have also this. Uh, were you thinking about some particular conflicts of uh, perhaps of uh, interest or, or conflicts of uh, between generations when you were tra translating the, the 80s sensibility into the modern times? Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. If you go back and watch 80s movies, there's, they spend a lot of time trying to find each other in, in <laughs> movies because they don't have cell phones. Um, uh, you know, people get lost and they can't communicate to each other where they are. Like so many movies now could be resolved by just giving the characters cell phones. And so that was actually a big conflict. They spend a lot of this book like walking around trying to figure out how to get from one place to another, um, which I thought was really was 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 an interesting way of looking at it. Like the second issue they are trying to look for a phone booth and they just never find one and they can't figure out how people talk. And so, um, uh, so there were some things like that, that, that I had from doing, you know, research by watching old movies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but some things uh, really surprised me, like in the convention scene where they do start a fight um, uh, and the cops show up. And I realized that in America, the police from the 1980s to till today have really become militaristic. Like they have actual tanks and tear gas and, uh, and you know, masks and they look really menacing. And that was not the case in the 1980s. And that was something I didn't realize until I started writing the scene. And there, so uh, the jocks react to the police with sort of the same shock that I, I realized it. So there, it's a mix of things that I planned and things that I thought about. And then things where I was like, oh my God, this, this would be very different. Um, uh, and so, uh, and and they just kept coming as I was as I was working on the book, um, uh, and because I, I'm not a very nostalgic person, I don't think back, you know, like oh things were better in the '80s because they weren't. They weren't for me personally. I I don't wish I was in high school at all. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I don't wish that, uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I like the old comics that I read, but, um, but a lot of them don't, didn't age well. Um, and so, uh, so it was interesting to sort of put myself back in that, in that headspace and sort of work through, you know, what would I, what would I think now if I were confronted with a cell phone um, and, and trying to, trying to figure it out. And, and that was some of the most fun parts, I think. All right, uh, let's go with Gilberto. You have uh, one of your uh, 35,000 questions that you have already prepared. <laughs> one of the one, one zillion, uh, No, uh, first of all, uh, I think that sensibility is not a word that can be uh, very much associated with the uh, Oscar character from the 80s. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they, we don't go hand in hand. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of uh, personal issues that you attacked in the book during the... the, or the Five issues of the book mm -hmm. that were amazingly created. First of all, congratulations. Uh, there, there was uh, two, two main, three main relationships that pretty much uh, let me know uh, when I when I was reading the book. Uh, first of all, I was blaming you because and beat them one player because uh, they made me read it with thirty days of space one between other, mm -hmm. and it was like, uh, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and uh, one was uh, the the mild jokester who turned out to be gay, uh -huh. and uh, his uh, girlfriend of uh, of the time from the eighties. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, you tackled that uh, wonderful. Oh, the thank second, you. The, sec the second was the the alpha male, the the big the big mini. Yeah. Uh, sure. His relationship with his father, mm -hmm. and how how you left us see that. Uh, like you said, it's not like everything is black and white, and uh, you may have bullied someone without even realizing mm. it. But we see the consequence: how he was abused by his father, and how there there comes a point in time when a, when a people when a, when a person has to say enough is enough and confront uh, whoever. And that's something that that caught my attention because that's something that the the baby boomers that pretty well. That we generation X, uh, some part of the generation X, tend to stand up and say enough is enough. 
but millennials keep crying all the time. <laughs> it's like, oh no, my fields, oh no, leave me alone, oh my space, oh my grammar, oh my god, uh, oh my new idea that's uh, from 30 years ago. <laughs> and uh, that's something that, that you pretty much tackle it uh, amazingly, uh, like you said. How did you find all this character uh, coming together, me uh, meshing the, with the history and the interaction because it goes so fluid uh, through all the, the five numbers? Uh, how did you manage to, to, to do that? Oh, thank you. I Well, you know, I mean, um, a lot of this book was, was trying to figure out... Um, because the, uh, I don't, <laughs> there are a lot of ways I could say this wrong. <laughs> Oops. Don't worry. We, we, we can uh, edit everything. Well, uh, not really, but uh, it's yeah, never yeah. wrong. It's never wrong. Um, I, I want with the right box. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make news. It'll be great. Uh, I think that um, uh, there was a big push, an anti-bullying push in, in America a few years ago. Um, uh, that actually my, uh, that started with, uh, with my employer at the time, his name's Dan Savage, and he started a campaign called It Gets Better, um, which was an anti-bullying campaign that was specifically aimed at LGBT youth. Um, and, uh, so, uh, and that campaign was a great thing because it sort of, uh, it, 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 it really clarified the line between what is okay and what is not okay with bullying. But I also thought, as I said, when I was writing the book, I thought the lines about what it, ta what it means to be a bully um, are different. I think that, I don't think that, I don't think that people are born terrible bullies, right? And I don't think that, that everybody is a bully their whole life. But I do think that pretty much everybody has probably bullied somebody else. And so I wanted to think about the what what's behind that? Why why people would feel the need to bully somebody else? And a lot of the time it comes out of powerlessness. And sometimes it comes out of a deep sort of uh, hating yourself. And sometimes it comes because you don't know your your place in the world. And so you um, so you just follow along with the bully and you, you do what they do. And that, that's sort of the, the three main, main jocks, right? Like I think that, um, that Chad, the leader is just filled with rage because his father had this cycle of violence that he brought out on him. And then, uh, uh, you know, and so, and Steve was, 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 uh, gay at a time when it was not okay to be gay. And so he was, he was taking it out too. And then Drew, um, was you know on if he were alive today if you were born you know 10 years ago he'd be a total nerd and um and uh at the time it wasn't okay for uh for a lot of black kids to be nerds um you know especially he he was sort of pigeonholed into being a football player and so um i just wanted to address the different ways that people wind up doing these things because I, I think that the act of being a bully is bad, but I don't think that people are born bad. And I wanted to understand what the thinking was behind that. So that's another long winded answer to say that's, that's, <laughs> that was the thinking behind, behind trying to, trying to put myself in that space and figure out, you know, have a little compassion. And, and I didn't want to do that in a way that said, well, bullying is okay. Or that, um, you know, these, these people, what they're doing is a logical response, but I did want to sort of give them the room to tell their stories and say why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and, and also I think that, you know, um, I, I think that a lot of my generation, the generation X, our generation, uh, um, I think that our parents' generation maybe saved us from a lot of that sort of cycle of abuse and things like that. I know that in my family, you know, my dad was a, was a wonderful man and he didn't abuse me, but he told me a story once when he was a kid um, growing up, he had a comic. It was sort of like a Beatle Bailey ripoff. It was a sad sack comic. Um, the character's name was sad sack and he was in the military and my dad was reading it and he was laughing. And uh, my granddad who I never knew uh, uh, beat him up because he was laughing at a comic book and he was in a bad mood that day, you know? And so 
my dad saved me from that kind of cycle of abuse. He didn't, he never did that to me because he was wrestling with his own demons. And so, um, and I think that the next generation, the, the millennials, I think they're doing a really good job of getting in touch with their, themselves and, and figuring it out and talking it through, you know, because I think that every generation is trying to wrestle with what the last generation gave them. And so I'm, I'm, I'm the, the, the jocks in the story are sort of doing that um, uh, in real time, you know, because they, they didn't have the, the, the 30, 40 years in between to sort of, uh, or 30 years in between to, um, to grow and to change. So it's like they got pushed into the deep end of the pool. Mm -hmm. And for example, uh, before, uh, hold on a, a little bit, uh, yeah, yeah. We, so we're yeah, going to see that. if first, uh, Ricardo is right now online. Let's see if he has a question or if he wants to say hi. Uh, he's, I believe, in, on the streets. He's working in the night. And uh -huh. Ricardo, uh, Paul... Don't, don't tell where. <laughs> he's working at the corner. I, I won't reveal exactly <laughs> where. Uh, he's uh, selling uh, newspapers. Uh, first of all, uh, Ricardo, Paul, uh, now you're introduced. And uh, do hi. you have a, a, a question, uh, Rick? Yes, of course. Firstly, I would like to congratulate uh, Paul. Oh, thank you. Planet of the Nerds and the deal. Uh, cross fingers. Yeah, and yeah. And my question is, you plan, uh, you put in the planet of the nerds that now the nerds uh, kind of rule the world, no? Yeah. But my question is, is better, is a better world this now or was better when the bullies were the one <laughs> in the head? The ruling class. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know if it's, I don't know if either one is better. I think that, um, I think that because of the internet, I think more people feel a little more comfortable being the, who they are. And I think that's better. Um, but I think there are some things about the eighties that were better. I think that, um, that having the sort of shared experience of, uh, of, of one sort of popular culture was probably better for us as a culture. Um, I think that like, you know, we're seeing with Facebook, it's sort of tearing people apart um, because we don't see ourselves in each other the way that we did, uh, at, at, you know, in the 1980s. But um, so I don't know if there's a better or a worse. I do think that sort of like the power hierarchies are are terrible. And um, and so I, I don't I, I would prefer it if nobody ruled the world. Does that make me a socialist? Maybe. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I, I would rather not see any one type of person rule the world. Um, I would rather see everybody have a share. For exactly. sure. Okay. And uh, for example, just uh, mention uh, a little bit about that. Uh, I remember that when uh, the news were released about the, the that Paramount option, the, the, the planet of the nerds for a future film, it's like yeah. the first step for the adaptation. One of the things that you mentioned and, and uh, it struck like uh, really strong with the, with me and uh, because right now the ruling class in popular culture are the nerds and, and you can see in the box office all the influence. But uh, with that, there should actually be some sort of responsibility because, and I am quoting here, you can tell us if those weren't your words, but uh, when your subculture becomes a monoculture, there is some investigation that needs to happen around the responsibilities that come along with that. Uh, constant, Paul Constant said, the, there is regressive behavior, a kind of entitled toxic masculinity in nerd, nerd culture that runs counter to this brainy victim narrative. I wanted to address that as well. Obviously, that that's reflected in the comic book. Uh, uh, here you can tell us that I never say that because after all, uh, these are supposed to, to be your words. But for example, we also see some sort of uh, toxicity right now. Uh, when uh, when you find the guys who were the, who were the underdogs before because you were reading comic books and then you were bullied because that wasn't uh, something popular like sports uh, used to put one example but then yeah. right now if you don't know all the details about all the the armor that iron man has wear in, in his entire history you are very stupid and i'm going to bully you because you have no interest and, and then you have the counterpart but it's like some sort of action reaction and as I mentioned, you deal with a lot of this in, in, in the comics and uh, in, in this particular series. Do you think that we have actually to, to, to be more like insistent in that uh, with this kind of power, with, with this kind of dominance, or in this case in popular culture, you actually have to, ha to, 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 to deal with the consequences and responsibilities in here? 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, um, yeah, no, he, that, that, um, that, that piece you read from was from Forbes and it's, uh, Rob Salkowitz and he's a great reporter. And yeah. that was, that was a quote. Uh, <laughs> <All right>. uh <laughs> <laughs> he did not misquote me. He's a, he's, a, he's a very good reporter. He wrote a very good book about nerd culture. In fact. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that, um, uh, uh, yeah, it's weird. Like the minute that that people get a little bit of power, they want to lord it over somebody else. You know, like I think that like what you were referring to that gatekeeping of, um, oh, you don't know what happened in Iron Man one hundred and sixty three or something like that. It's it's a very real thing, and it's something that 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 um, I think it's a human impulse. I think it's something that we all want to do. But I think that it's it's important, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that's something uh, I just made that up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's something that um, I think that it's that's what the book addresses in a, in a large extent, I think, because it's about um, uh, it's about finding your. Uh, yeah, it's about you know we don't have to kick people away from the table we can make the table bigger and that's the great thing about about modern uh uh geek culture is there's so much and you know like maybe i don't find uh i don't know fantasy novels i've never been able to get into tolkien and that's okay that doesn't mean <gasps> to sorry <laughs> don't hurt me uh that that doesn't mean that Tolkien is bad. It just means that it's not my particular brand of nerd, you know? Like, I like sci-fi. I like superheroes. I like uh, horror. I like all that stuff. And um, uh, and I think that it's, 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 it's okay. And if I want to get into Tolkien, then I can, I can do that. And maybe, um, uh, maybe I shouldn't be shamed because I don't know everything about it or something like that. And so... Yeah, I think that's that's something that we are coming to terms with right now. And 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 you know, there's there's a really bad sort of uh, sub culture on the internet of of nerds who are very upset because not all the superheroes are white males anymore, and they feel like you know, like that white men are being threatened, uh, and that 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 they're being wiped out of comic books, and that's not true. But I'm sure it feels like that if you if if all you ever see are white men in your culture, you know, and so um, so, yeah, we need to we need to think about how to be more generous because we're not fighting over, you know, it's not nerddom is not like a it's a it's a renewable resource. There's enough for everybody. So that's that's part of what I was trying to do to do with the book for sure. Yeah, I think right. I admit that it's funny or kicking the people out of the table more yeah. fun make it bigger <laughs> and it's uh, that's 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 work in yeah. that <laughs> make a, a table bigger yes exactly it's, <laughs> it is. It's, it's a little bit of work but it pays off right it pays off in 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 huge ways by 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 welcoming people in but at first it's a little uncomfortable it's a little uncomfortable when you um you know when you when you don't know everything about about a a, a culture i'm sure you know like some of these people went to see Black Panther and they were uncomfortable because they don't know anything about, um, you know, African culture or something like that. And so for these white nerds, they felt threatened by that when in fact, it's just, it's a, it's a really good superhero movie and it didn't take away any of the other, you know, white male superhero movies that were there before. It's additive. It doesn't, it doesn't take away um, but but there so, are yeah. also w one thing Paul because uh, at least in in uh, and I, when I say American culture I don't only mean the United States I also mean Canada Mexico and, and sure, the, yeah. the, the entire continent but it's yeah. something that we lack the most because uh, uh, Black Panther is a fine movie it's a great movie it doesn't matter if you like it or if, if you don't it represents a, a part of culture but perhaps it's a part of culture that you weren't related because you didn't know about it for example in my case I like a lot of black exploitation movies and for me it was like you know I, I uh, even popular movie, movies like uh, Oz or like um, uh, 
um, the, uh, work that is being made by, by, by different filmmakers is more representative of black culture, of, of uh, African-American culture. But however, because you weren't exposed to this, you feel you, you might feel threatened in this case, but it, it just uh, kind of pushes us to, to look farther to what is just presented in your faces in, 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 uh, in the cinemas, in books, in magazines, because there is always something more that perhaps we are just ignoring because we're ignorant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that, you know, I think I'm I'm a big believer in 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 fiction and and uh, uh, and comics and movies. They're they're empathy tools, right? They put you in somebody else's head. And that's 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 why they're so great. Um, you know, I will never know what it's like to be you. But if you wrote a book and I read it, then I might have a little better idea of what it's like to be you. And I think that's, that's better for you and it's better for me. And so um, I think if, if, if you are complaining about, a, about a, a comic or a movie because it made you uh, think about things in a different way, then, then you've got a little work to do you know, on yourself <laughs> because you're, you're, um, you're running away from the whole reason that, that, that storytelling exists. I exactly. Think. So we're going to go to a final round of questions. Uh, we're going to go first with uh, Daniel, then we're going to go with Ricardo uh, if he connects, and after that we're going to with the final question with Gilberto. Uh, to... one. Just Why only one. You have to one. You, you have to think very well about that. Uh, Daniel, <laughs> let's go with you. Ah, uh, thanks. Uh, it's about Chad. Uh, how do you think he felt uh, in 30 years since? He wake up. He will be more comfortable than now. Oh, mm -hmm. well, Spoiler. that might be something. Yeah, that might be something that we might uh, that we might uh, have to focus on in the future. But I think I like to think that um, in the end uh, that he's more comfortable with himself. So I think that that would mean that he would be more comfortable in the future. I think that. I think that Chad is the one who throughout the series, he causes the most problems, but I think that by the end, he's maybe, he's maybe learned a little bit um, as much as he can in his, you know, thick head. Um, so I think it would be for the better. Yes, absolutely. It's a great oh. question though. <laughs> All right. And, <laughs> and Ricardo, I believe that he just uh, missed the boat because he's no longer with us. So Gilberto, oh. you have chance for two questions. <laughs> 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 That's what I meant when, it's, when I said it's easier to kick people out of the table. Yeah? <laughs> Mission accomplished. Prove me wrong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, first, uh, I think it's pretty funny that uh, Chad and all, all the other guys find homosexuality uh, kind of weird coming from the 80s because if you were into glam rock and all that stuff, I remember wearing the. I had hair and I didn't had long hair. And uh, the more girlish you look the more attractive you were to girls i think they would just like another friend or something like that right mm -hmm. but uh, do you think that is there a chance that we may see a, a sequel to, to your book in where you explode or you, you try to make us see what's the life for the nerds and all the connections but because i think that's pretty pretty important that all the connections that they had when, uh, while in the 80s, uh, what happened to the people, how they react now that they are public uh, figures, uh, once the, the big evil freezing the whole planet, uh, I know what you did, okay? the day after tomorrow was the movie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what happened, uh, do you think that the, the characters may really may have really evolved from, from what happened to them? Would they be more, uh, they have more acceptance from all the, the nerd culture, the, the gay culture, uh, even for the, the bully, for the bullies, because uh, we are people, yes, have no, not feelings, but something pretty, pretty close to that. Yeah. Uh, do you think that, that we, may, we may be able to see, do you think that how, how long can you stretch this book? Well, um, you know, when, when I first pitched the book, I thought this was going to be my only comic. Um, <laughs> I, I, I thought, um, because I've done some, some short stories for Ahoy Comics, um, 
in the wrong earth. And I have a, a series called Snelson about a, a, a stand-up comedian uh, that, that just ran in the back of a, a, a Hoy comic called uh, Hashtag Danger. But when I pitched nerds, that was the first thing I pitched to Ahoy. And so I thought I was never going to get another chance to do this. And so I actually just intended the book to be one thing that was in uh, w- done um, when it was over. And so, um, uh, so I kind of screwed myself. I don't <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think there there are ways that I can continue the story. Um, and Alan and I were talking about that a little bit. And um, also, um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we did just announce that uh, Paramount Players, which is a production company, uh, is going to be developing it to be a movie. Um, and they're really smart, funny people. Um, and uh, we were talking about ways that the that the movie could be different than, than the book also and the way that it could incorporate, um, like one of the things that I regret is that the book didn't have more female characters because I think that there, I think that, that women nerds definitely existed in the 1980s and they were almost invisible. And so I kind of didn't represent them at all. And so I, I want to know what that's like. Right. So, um, so there are all sorts of places that I, I, I want to and, and can keep exploring and that I think that they will explore in the movie also. So I think there's all sorts of ways that it can go, and I'm excited about that. Um, and so I think that there will be more exploration, yes, um, and, and seeing how people have grown and maybe haven't grown um, along the way. So, yeah, absolutely. So that means that it will be more issues of the science of the nerds. Uh, it means that, 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 that we, have, we have talked about it and, uh, and it's something that I didn't think would be possible when I first pitched it because I thought I was lucky enough to get one book, so I shouldn't ask for any more. Um, uh, that now it's, it's definitely something that we are, uh, talking about. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's hope, uh, uh one of the things that, uh, we had mentioned and we, when we interview Tom, uh, it's one of the points that, uh, points that he made. And it's one of the ways that I believe it's it's uh, how you work with the storytelling is that you don't have to force in this case when you have an idea to to force a mini series to make it an an ongoing title if you don't have uh, that was Tom uh, complaining no yeah. no no <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you don't have to force it to fill twelve issues if you don't have enough material and, and if the quality you feel that uh, will be lacking as as you continue with the story and in this case well you have a, a story that has a beginning and end and you have the promise for something and you have characters that that, that you want to to know more about it as uh, daniel uh, uh, asked before but uh, yeah. well, that's part of the beauty of a storytelling that you don't have to force it and you always can get a second season uh, in ahoy so mm-hmm. yeah yeah um yeah i think that tom is a really strong advocate for stories told the way they should be told. And I think that, um, you know, I think as a, as a lifelong comic fan, I think I, I, you know, we've all experienced stories that have gone on for too long. Um, and we, we, uh, you know, because people just want to keep the, the tires spinning. And so I think that, um, I think that, that, that Tom really wants his writers to tell the story that they want to tell. And so, um that's really exciting to me because i have like three other jobs i don't need to <laughs> i i don't need to keep going back to a well but i think that that it's interesting to keep a story going in different ways and to try new things with sequels that maybe haven't been done before i think some of the best sequels do different things you know godfather 2 is different than godfather and um uh and so so uh uh yeah so i think that that one of the things I really like about Ahoy is it's not just about the money and it's not just about, you know, it's not just about uh, uh, keeping the wheels spinning to keep readers coming back. I think that they genuinely, they want, they want to develop artists. They don't want to develop uh, intellectual properties. Right. So <laughs> they want, they, they, you know, they're, they're, they're great about keeping, you know, Alan's been working for Ahoy pretty much nonstop since he started because he's so great and they want to keep in the, Alan Robinson business and they, they, you know, I think they, they want to keep publishing books by me, um, which is really flattering and really nice. And, um, and so I'm, I want to do as many different things as I can too. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if there were to be a nerd sequel, it would be very different because, um, 
I think nobody wants to read a sequel that's the same as the first one. Like Teen Wolf 2. Did you ever see Teen Wolf 2? <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. Teen Wolf 1 all over again with basketball. It was so dumb. Um, or or you, you can use the Robocop formula because uh, you only yeah. have to have instead of one billion, two billions and make it like the, the, the bad reflection of the main character. Wait a minute. Yeah. Marvel uses that in a lot of his <laughs> movies. Mm. All right. So we're about to, to end this transmission. But before uh, we go, I want to remind people that, well, of course, this uh, we have been talking about uh, comic books and you can find pretty much about this and a lot of titles in the main page from Ahoy Comics, comicsahoy.com. And uh, of course, you can find there more information about this particular series, all the covers, and you can buy them uh, either on physical or on digital. So please do it because uh, that's the way that you can support your favorite artist is by supporting uh, supporting them with uh, with money. That that the, the cash <laughs> speaks louder than tweets, believe me. And uh, if they want to con uh, to contact you, Paul, uh, there are a lot of ways, but I believe that Twitter is the easiest way, right? Yeah, Twitter is, I'm on Twitter all the time, uh, and you can track, like, all the different writing that I do. I do writing about books, I do writing about politics, I do writing about, uh, yeah, I have the site called the Seattle Review of Books. I have, uh, I write for a blog called Civic Skunk Works, where I write about economics. Um, but my Twitter is where you can find everything all at once. So that's at Paul Constant, P-A-U-L-C-O-N-S-T-A-N-T. There you have it. And uh, of course, if you want to hear a little bit more, uh, more, more about Dalan, uh, believe me, I will be in contact with him to, for a future interview uh, for, for another topic, for another show, but that's uh, for, uh, for another occasion. And in case that you want to... Uh, I, I'm all for hearing more from Alan. <laughs> Alan. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And uh, I was just wondering because, well, uh, with Alan and with you, we can do the interview all in English, but if we do it all in Spanish because the majority of the participants is Spanish, speaking uh, would you be able to to keep track with us i i could not i understand <laughs> spanish but i can't speak it demonios uh, yeah yeah my my i would be very quiet and i i could get what you were saying but i would not be able to my my wife is fluent in spanish and Ooh. she spent a lot of time in peru and i went to uh peru as well um and i love it and i love spanish uh so maybe she could translate for me she's great <laughs> And also w one final thing that uh, I want to to mention just just right before we go, in case that you want to to find a picture of all your favorite uh, artists, writers, and editors uh, in the last issue of Planet of the Nerds, <laughs> you can actually find them. Uh, we're seeing you uh, right there. We're seeing Tom. We're we're seeing Alan. Well, we're we're seeing uh, the the merry bunch of Ahoy Comics. We really love the work that you all uh, you all are doing in there. And uh, Uh, remember, people, uh, the way that you can support the series is not complaining on Twitter because you you want more exposure <laughs> of the characters is buying the work and supporting. And uh, we uh, we were really delighted when we heard the news that uh, is the first step. Obviously, you cannot uh, be sure until you buy the ticket for the movie, but uh, we yeah. are confident that uh, it's going to get there uh, in, 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 when the time comes. So once again, congratulations, uh, Alan. And if you want, uh, all of you who are watching this, if you want more information about that, you have the ways to contact Alan and you can follow us, fo follow us uh, in the Stripando, uh, where you can have this and more shows. And pretty much that's everything. Alan, thank you. Uh, uh, I, Alan, Alan is not here, sorry. Uh, he's uh, on the other Alan. line. Alan, wait a, a little bit, please. And Paul, Paul, who is actually here, thank you very much for your time. And, and, thank and you so much for experience. having me. It was a real yeah. pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for the great questions. I really appreciate it. All right, and uh, we will see each other in the following show, and uh, let's go with the intro animation. Okay.